human society has always had psychopaths, and Africa has been no exception to the seeming rise of serial murders. Some remain unsolved, their perpetrators walking among an unsuspecting population. Did you know that South Africa ranks among the world's worst three countries after the US and Russia for serial murders and rapes? Since 1936, 71 serial murderers have been identified in South Africa. Johannesburg and Pretoria are the worst affected cities in South Africa, and Johannesburg and Durban the worst areas when it comes to serial killers. Up to five new serial killers are identified across the country every year. First on our list is David Simling, who is a Swazi serial killer who caused havoc from the late 1990s until late 2001. His murder spree began in 1997, around the time he was released from prison for a prior conviction of rape. It was one of the many times, about 18, since 1976 that he had been convicted of robbery and rape. The last conviction was significant because he would later claim that he had robbed the woman, but he had never raped her. For him, the 28 women and children he would later kill were revenge for the wrongful conviction. Simulane lured most of his victims to the woods of Malkerns with job prospects, where he would then kill and bury them in shallow graves. He seemed to have had an accomplice called Vilakati, on whose farm the first six bodies were uncovered in July 2000. Two Mozambicans he hired to dig the graves, tipped off the police who then launched a manhunt for Vilakati. They found him eight months later and chased him through a maze field before they shot him dead. After his arrest, Simulane led the police to shallow graves in Manzini, where 45 bodies were found, including several pregnant women. Many of them had been strangled, but some had been stabbed with a knife. Simulane was found guilty of a total of 28 murders, and acquitted of six. He was sentenced to death in 2011, seven years after his trial began. A total of 83 witnesses testified against him. He claimed that he had been tortured and coerced to confess to the murders. Second on our list is the B1 Butcher. On June 13, 2007, a 36-year-old woman disappeared somewhere on Independence Avenue in Windhoek, Namibia. Three and a half days later, a mutilated female torso was found in a garbage bin next to Namibia's B1 Road. It had been professionally severed from the rest of the body and was itself dissected into two. For investigators, the torso was more than just a part of a corpse, it was proof that a dreaded unknown killer was back on the hunt. Nicknamed the B1 Butcher because the way he methodically dissects his victims and where he disposes of their body parts, this killer is possibly still at large. His favorite dumping points are rubbish bins near major roads, not only the National B1 Road. The B1 Butcher has been killing since at least 2005 when the first body was found near a power station. Of his five known victims, two were never identified. The other three were Juanita Mabula murdered in 2005, Melanie Jantz and Santa Helena. All of them were young colored Namibian women. Their body parts, at least those that were ever found, showed signs of freezing or refrigeration, suggesting that he was preserving them for a while before dumping them. His method of killing seemed to have evolved or have been inconsequential for his motives. Mabula was hit on the head with a blunt object, while Jantz was strangled. An extensive police manhunt that drew in international assistance yielded two suspects. German citizen Heinz Nierum and Han Husselmann. Nirum was acquitted in 2010 for lack of evidence. Husselman, on the other hand, became a prime suspect after he committed suicide in 2008. Giro's DNA was found in his flat, while his DNA was found on a letter to the police that detailed the Mabula murder. Despite this, the trail went cold, and the killing house has never been found. The B1 butcher either survives or died in the intervening period. The latest activity suspected to be his handiwork was in 2010 when a human head and an arm were found in Rehoboth. It could be his work or that of a copycat. Third on our list we have Raya and Sakina. In December of 1920, the rotting dismembered remains of a woman were found lying on a street. What seemed like a one-off crime became a serial one when a man digging to find a damaged water pipe discovered a number of female remains in what looked like a burial room. Later investigations showed that Raya and Sakina had been renting the house at the time of the murders, and the heat turned on them. These two ruthless, murderous sisters hold the infamy of being the first women to be executed in modern-day Egypt. They were the leaders of a killing party of five which include a husband, a boyfriend, and an accomplice. The two enterprising sisters founded an extensive drug and prostitution ring that revolved around five homes in the Laban district of Alexandria. It is from here that they perfected a murderous killing team of five that killed at least 17 women. Working as a ruthlessly efficient team, they would then strangle the victim as she slept into unconsciousness. One of the killers would clamp his hands over the victim's mouth, another would grab hold of her throat, a third would hold her hands behind her back, and the fourth would pin down her feet until she stopped breathing. Abdullal was in charge of holding the feet. Abdullal was Sakina's boyfriend. The postmortems showed that all the victims died of suffocation and not strangulation. In her chilling confession, Sakina kept saying the infamous line death passed that W.A.Y. after describing each death. Fourth on our list, in February of 2000, a 36-year-old man called Charles Kwanza was arrested for the murder of his girlfriend, Joyce Boding. 
An additional murder charge was added a few days later, that of a hairdresser called Akio Sirwa. Sirwa's body had been found near Kumasi Sports Stadium on January 19, 1996. The names on Kwanza's charge sheet kept increasing, and he was finally accused of killing 34 women. All the victims had been found lying in supine positions with their legs widely opened. There was clear evidence of rape, including a discarded condom near the victim's body. It perhaps fit too well that the Ghanaian mechanic had a history. In 1986, Kwanza had been jailed for rape. After his release, he raped another woman and was jailed again. Prior to his arrest in 2000, he had been serving a jail sentence for robbery. The story of the Kumasi rapist seemed to have finally ended with the apprehension of a man who had history and motives to kill. But that was not the end. There were 21 murders of young women in and around Accra in 1999. Four more were killed in the first half of 2000, with two of them being found within one week of each other and outside Madaheko, the primary dumping site of the most of the first murders. Kwanza's arrest followed this outcry and in public, the police said that he confessed to nine other murders, but they only charged him with one initially, and then added ten more. The most damning evidence that Kwanza was most likely not the killer, was that the killings continued after his arrest. By December 2000, the murders had reached a total of 31. Being an election year, the serial murders became a primary political issue, leading to the voting out of the interior minister and his deputy. Lastly, known as the Ted Bundy of South Africa, Moses was arguably the most dangerous, and yet charming of African serial killers. He was intelligent, polished, and psychopathic. To lure victims, he established a dummy organization called Youth Against Human Abuse, purportedly dedicated to eradicating child abuse. He would then invite applications from women for various positions. Answering the call was the first mistake, because the mild-mannered, smartly-dressed executive was not what he seemed. After the interview, Moses would lead his victims through an open field, where he would then attack them, drag them away from sight, rape them, and strangle them with their own underwear. He then carved the word bitch on their corpses. Sometimes, he would call the victims' families to taunt them. Moses first did this in Adderidgeville, then Boxburg and finally Cleveland in Johannesburg. When the pattern was finally uncovered, the murders became widely known as the ABC murders. They attracted national attention, forcing even President Mandela to personally appeal for public assistance. The spree ended when a witness confessed to having seen Moses with one of the victims. Background checks revealed that he had been arrested for rape in his teens and had served seven years. When he realized he had been made, Moses disappeared. He reappeared in October 1995, when he made a call to journalist Tamsin Beer. In characteristic psychopathic pride, he claimed 76 victims, and gave directions for a body that had not been found. The manhunt began in earnest, and ended on a Johannesburg street with Moses writhing on the ground, immobilized by three bullets, including one in his buttocks. During his trial, Moses claimed that he had killed women, because they reminded him of the women who had falsely accused him of rape. He was found guilty of 40 rapes and 38 murders. He had killed 37 young women and one child. The court sentenced him to a total of two, 410 years in jail, with the possibility of parole after 930 years.